Hello, we welcome you to the program. We'll be studying Job chapter 32 of the book of Job. Turn to Job 33, 32, and let's begin. After Job finishes his discourse, Elihu gives his sixth chapter presentation in chapters 32 to 37. In Job 32, verses 1 to 5, we have an introduction to Elihu. Verse 1, so these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Job's three friends included Eliphaz, the Temamite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite, in Job 2.11. After three rounds of dialogue between Job and his three friends in Job 3-31, these three men ceased answering Job. They refused to answer him any further and did not respond to Job's last speech in chapters 26 to 31. The reason, according to this passage, was because he was righteous in his own eyes. As he kept insisting on his own righteousness, they were unable to convince him of his unrighteousness. Verse 2, then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. First, who was Elihu? As with Job's three friends, little background information is given concerning Elihu. Barakel, his father, was called the Buzite, indicating that Barakel was a descendant or a resident of Buzz. Some suggest that Elihu might have been a descendant of Buzz, the son of Nahor, Abraham's brother, in Genesis 22, 20-21. We suggested at the introduction of the book that the book appears to have been written during the time of the patriarchs. Then again, Barakel might have been an inhabitant of the place of Buzz, like in Jeremiah 25 and 23. Repeated a number of times in the passage is wrath of Elihu. Elihu was angry because Job justified himself rather than God. While the three friends argued against Job, was suffering because he was sinning, Elihu argues that Job was sinning because he was suffering concerning his, his pride. And seeking to justify himself, he spoke unjustly of God. At least, this is the argument of Elihu. Verse 3. Also against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Elihu was angry at Job's three friends because they had found no answer and yet condemned Job. They condemned Job without being able to answer or refute Job's arguments. Verse 4. Now, because they were years older than he, Elihu wanted to wait, had waited to speak to Job. Elihu had waited to speak to Job out of respect for their older age. They were years older than he. Verse 4, 5. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was aroused. Elihu saw that the three men ceased answering Job, verse 1. They had no answer for Job to refute his arguments. What about the wrath of Elihu? Again, the introduction speaks of Elihu's wrath four times. First, the wrath of Elihu was aroused against Jacob or against Job. Verse 2. Second, his wrath was aroused. Again, in verse 2, 
Third, his wrath was aroused against Job's three friends because they condemned Job, verse 3. And fourth, his wrath was aroused against the three men because they had no answer, verse 5. The term aroused in this passage means to be hot or to burn with anger. And we might say that they were he was very angry with these men. And so his anger burned against these, these men. Verses 6 to 9, we have Elihu's hesitancy to speak. Verse 6. So Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young in years, and you are very old. Therefore, I was afraid and dare not declare my opinion to you. As far as we can tell from the book, Elihu stood by while the other friends spoke to Job. And now Elihu reveals his presence and, and begins to speak. Evidently, Elihu was much younger than Job and the three friends. The author says that they were years older than Elihu, verse 4. And after waiting, Elihu now speaks to Job. He describes himself as being young in years and Job as being very old. Age is relative. We're not told how old Job or the other men were. We're not told how young Eliphaz or how young Elihu was either. Only that Elihu was young in years and Job was, as he saw, very old. Elihu says that he was afraid to give his opinion to Job. That word opinion might be literally translated as knowledge. And so he was hesitant to proclaim what he knew. At least what he thought he knew. Verse 7. I said age should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. Elihu said to himself that those who are older should speak. And with their many years, he expected to hear wisdom from the older men. However, he was disappointed. Verse 8, he said, But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Elihu says that there is a spirit in man. He also says that it is the breath of the Almighty who gives understanding. While wisdom may come with multitude of years, verse 8, wisdom or understanding is ultimately from the Almighty. Elihu, who was younger, would now speak. Verse 9. Again, according to verse 8, uh, he may or may not have claimed that he received special understanding from the Almighty. Here's simply the case that he's saying that for a while I held back from speaking because they were older and I was younger, but he now says that there's a spirit in man, and he also says how that the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. And so his basis for beginning to speak. He goes on in verse 9: Great men are not always wise, nor do they, nor do the aged always understand justice. So he continues to give explanation for while now, despite being hesitant to speak, is now determined to speak. Elihu says, contrary to expectation that great men are not always wise. This is true of men of position and age. The term great here may refer to men of many years. Likewise, aged men do not always understand justice or the exercise of justice. Verses 10 to 14, Elihu decides to speak. 
Verse 10, therefore I say, listen to me, I also will declare my opinion. While Elihu hesitated to share his opinion due to respect for the older age of, of the men, verse 6, now he's determined to share his opinion or knowledge. He calls for the three men to listen to him. And so listen to his opinion. Listen to what he thinks, what he knows, to his knowledge. Verse 11, indeed, I waited for your words. I listened to your reasonings while you searched out what to say. Elihu uses three different words in verse 11 and 12. First, he says that he waited for their words. And so he waited patiently for them to speak. He waited for them to give their understanding. Second, he listened to their reasonings. He waited and listened while they looked for words to say. Verse 12, I paid close attention to you, and surely not one of you convinced Job or answered his words. And so third, Elihu says that he paid attention to the three men, and yet not one of the men was able to convince Job that he is unrighteous. None of the men answered the words of Job. They were unable to answer or to refute his claims of being righteous. Despite the three men and their age and presumably their wisdom, they were unable to convince Job that he was unrighteous, nor were they able to answer Job to refute his argument that he was righteous. Verse 13. Lest you say we have found wisdom, God will vanquish him, not man. Elihu says that the three men had not convinced Job or answered his words in verse 12. And now he says that, he says this, lest the three men say, we have found wisdom. In fact, as they searched out what to say, verse 11, they had not found the wisdom to answer or to refute Job. They had not defeated him. Elihu concludes, God will vanquish him, not man. And so he left it up to God. And so lest they say we have found wisdom as if they had defeated or vanquished Job, he points out that he sat by patiently listening to them, paying attention to them, and they did not convince Job, nor did they answer Job. But here, El Elihu concludes, God will vanquish him, not man. Verse 14. Now he has not directed his words against me, so I will not answer him with your words. Elihu points out to the three friends that Job had not directed his words against him. Therefore, Elihu will not answer Job with the words of his three friends. He will start fresh. Now, whether he does or not, you be the judge. But let's go on. Verse 15. Verses 15 to 22, Elihu had said, or had much to say. He had a lot to say. Verse 15, he said, they are dismayed and answer no more. Words escape them. Elihu says that the three friends are dismayed. Uh, some versions amazed. They are dismayed. They are at a, lo a loss as to what else to say. They had searched out what to say, and now words escape them. Sometimes people today say, I have no words. And so their words escaped them. They were unable to find them. As a result, they ceased answering Job, verse 1. 
Verse 16. And I have waited because they did not speak, because they stood still and answered no more. Elihu waited out of respect for the older men. He waited on the three friends to speak, but they did not speak. Instead, they stood still and did not answer Job. The picture of them standing still. And earlier uh, of the words escaping them in verse 15. Instead, they stood still, did not answer Job. They acknowledged their defeat by their silence. When the friends first came to Job in Job 2.13, no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Was his grief no less great now? No. He was in a great deal of pain, physically, mentally. The friends would have been wise to have remained silent rather than to ignorantly accuse Job, their friend, of sin. Verse 17, I also will answer my part. I too will declare my opinion. The three friends had their opportunity to speak. Will Elihu remain silent? No. Now Elihu will answer his part. He'll have his say and declare his opinion. We might say that he would give his or share his two cents give his two cents worth. But he would declare his opinion, his judgment, his, his knowledge. Verse 18. For I am full of words. The spirit within me compels me. Why will Elihu speak? First, he says, I am full of words. Let's begin by saying that just because you have a lot to say doesn't mean that you should say it. Yes, he has a lot to say, as we'll see in the next chapters. Second, he says, the spirit within me compels me. Some versions say constrains me. Earlier, he said, there is a spirit in man. Verse 8, there's a spirit in Elihu too. And according to this passage, he said, the spirit within me compels me. He says that the spirit within me compels me to speak. It may be that he simply feels as though he must speak. Sometimes people feel similarly today. Certainly, he did have a lot to say. That cannot be denied. Job 32 to 37, which we'll study in future lessons, Lord willing. Does Elihu believe that the Almighty gave him understanding? Job 32, 8 and verse 13. It's not really clear, but it is clear. It is evident that he did have a lot to say. And he will say it later on in the following chapters. The main point is, is that he points out in verse 8, there is a spirit in man. And now in verse 18, he says, this spirit compels me to speak. And so he will speak. Verse 19. Indeed, my belly is like wine that has no vent. It is ready to burst like new wineskins. Elihu felt as though he was ready to burst. You know, he had all those words. He had a lot to say. First, he speaks of his belly as though it was wine. How so? Well, he put the wine for the container of the wine. And so it, he spoke figuratively in this sense putting the wine for the container of the wine. And as a container of wine without a vent or an opening, a container like a jar may burst, he so felt that as if he would burst himself. 
Second, he says that his belly is ready to burst like new wineskins. It was a common practice to store wine in containers. Uh, perhaps some, maybe rich, stored wine in jars, while maybe the poor stored them in wineskins, according to one source. But nevertheless, people stored wine, whether in jars or some other container, such as wine skins. These skins made of leather, such as leather bags of, of goat skin. His point is that he needs to speak or else he would burst. He might say he needs to vent. Of course, we read about his wrath four times earlier on in the chapter. He had a lot of anger. He had anger for Job, and he had anger for the friends of Job, too. And now, after all this waiting, wonder, one wonders how he could have contained himself. Now he feels as though he's compelled to speak, as if he's made to speak, and he will speak. For better or for worse. As far as wineskins, you might be familiar with wineskins mentioned in the New Testament. Jesus used the figure of wineskins in passages like Matthew 9, 16 to 17. Here we see the new wine was placed in new wineskins, and Jesus gives an explanation for why during his, his ministry. Matthew 9, 16, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Verse 17, now do they put, nor do they put wine, new wine, into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And so as the wine might continue to ferment, it might expand. And if it was placed in an old wineskin, it might break the wineskin. And both the new wine and the wineskin, the old wineskin, would be lost. And so the practice was to put new wine into new wineskins. The new wineskins would be able to handle the, the expansion. And so both the container and the wine would be preserved. And so the common practice was to use new wineskins. But even so, Elihu felt still as though he would burst. Verse 20. I will speak that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. Elihu is determined to speak. And he spends this chapter explaining why he needs to speak. It's only by speaking that he says he may find relief. He will open his lips and answer. His lips may be like a, a vent in verse 19 for his anger or wrath. He needs to get those words out. Can you imagine him standing by and he hears the arguments and, and claims of the friends to Job to try to refute Job but are unable to refute Job? And he's probably thinking to himself, I have the answer. I have it right here. If only he could speak. Well, now he has his, his chance, his opportunity to speak his mind. Verse 21. Let me not, I pray, show partiality to anyone, nor let me flatter any man. It's, it is good not to show partiality or to flatter people to get one's way or to win an argument. Here in verse 21, Elihu expresses his desire to handle the matter, which is noble, without showing partiality or personal favoritism. He will not favor one, he says, more than the other. 
whether Job or the three friends. He will also not flatter any man. So he he claims to to be higher or to be better than that. And so he will not flatter, he will not praise one over the other. Rather than take sides, he simply will speak his mind. He has a spirit, he says, head, and that spirit within him compels him to speak. Verse 22. The last verse of the chapter. For I do not know how to flatter, else my master would soon take me away. Did he or did he not know how to flatter? Elihu claims not to know how to flatter. Even if he were skilled in flattery, he believes that his maker would hold him accountable. He would destroy him. Of course, the three friends believed that, that if someone sinned, that they would be immediately judged in this life. Did Elihu believe the same? He says, I do, I do not know how to flatter, else my master would make her would take me away. We're not told anymore in the passage. But it was certainly was noble for Elihu to say that he wanted to be fair to avoid showing partiality or, or flattering anybody. That was good. In the following chapters, we'll see Elihu and his arguments. We hope that this has been helpful in better understanding Job chapter 32. And next time, Lord willing, we'll continue with the book. We thank you for, your, for being here today and encourage you to continue to study God's word.